Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Welcome to a virtual edition of RPV City Talk. It is great to have joining us from the Lomita Sheriff Station, the Captain James Powers. Busy, busy times. I'm glad you're taking time out to give us your update on what's going on during the pandemic with crime and the trends and everything that's going on right now. But I wanna start with you and your team and thank you for all you're doing on the front lines for starters. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Just Give us a scene setter. How is it going at the sheriff's station right now during COVID-19? How have you managed the operations? Right now, I think we're doing a little bit better than normal. Uh, in the beginning, it was a, a lot of adapting. And, and as, as time has progressed throughout this, uh, we're, we're, I don't want to say we're getting set in our ways a little bit, but we're managing things a lot, a lot smoother, I guess would be a safe word to use. Mm -hmm. In terms of the health and safety of your own staff, because you are frontline workers, you're out there and you're with the public. How, what are the protocols? What have you had to do to make sure that you're keeping your deputies safe, but also the public? So in the beginning, it was, it was actually kind of a scary moment. You know, we, uh, we weren't sure exactly what we were dealing with and how serious it was. And uh, as time went on, we, we would start uh, responding to medical rescue calls. We would have different, uh, scenarios where certain people were exposed to certain things and uh, the protocol was is, is if if anyone was exposed we needed to put them into our quarantine for uh, 14 days and so early on i had to um, quarantine one deputy uh, due to uh, an exposure off duty and and then i had one deputy that we thought had symptoms but just turned out to be allergies so we basically quarantined him for a day or two he went to his doctor and got a clean bill of health but then I had two additional deputies um, in March that we had to quarantine for 14 days due to being exposed to circumstances on medical rescue calls. Now, the, that's the bad news. The good news is they're all back and none of them uh, tested positive. So that's, that's the good news. And knock on wood, uh, we, we've managed to stay healthy. But it's, it, it was you know, really scary because in our line of work, uh, our job is to go out there and make contact with, with people. And, you know, there were some, I had some reservations up front where I was briefing my deputies, explaining that, you know, if, um, if you're going to, you know, jeopardize your health and safety to make a traffic stop or to write a citation, exercise some discretion. And what I found was my deputies, they continue to be proactive. And, and it, I was quite nervous about it just because of, of, the, of the consequences. But things have worked out. And so right. we're, we've been very fortunate. I know later on, we're going to talk about your latest crime statistics. And you think you all had mentioned when we were talking that, that the fact that they are out there making contact with the public and in fact, arrests you've made are up. So they're even more proactive at this point. So we yes. can... Okay, Captain, I want to move on to have a conversation about masks because there's a lot of confusion in the community right now. If they are legally required, if it's just you know, that it's suggested, but what's the deal? What, what is the rule on the masks? So the deal is uh, masks are required to, to make it short and sweet and simple. Um, and I re I've been relying on the, uh, the order that has come out from the Department of Public Health through the County of Los Angeles. And so with that, uh, a new order came out. It was revised just a few days ago. And the mask order is, is buried in, in further down in, into the weeds of the order, but it's in there. And so I searched that and I found it. And so it's, it's actually in the section three dash B and it talks about going out in public and wearing a mask and it's required to wear a mask. Okay. And, so just recommended. There's a lot of mask shaming. I feel like happening. We're watching on, you know, Facebook, you're seeing posts of people, you know, giving people a hard time if they don't have it. So the bottom line is if you wanted to, your deputies could technically arrest somebody. Yeah, technically, it's it's a it's a violation of health and safety code and of the LA County Code as well, and so it's it's a misdemeanor. Uh, have we done it yet? No, we have not. Um, I think we issued one citation, but not for a mask, but for something else. But uh, what what we're trying to do is to educate and inform folks. And all of my deputies have masks, and so if we make contact with somebody on a call for service or a situation where we need to address the fact that somebody's not wearing a mask, they're going to give them one. And you know, it, it kind of does two things. One, it, it just, it keeps the situation low key and, and mellow uh, because people are, they're a little frustrated with all these new things and we're not used to it. Uh, and, and so it, it allows them to gain compliance. And, and so that's kind of what we're doing in, in you know, educate, inform and, and, and gain some cooperation. Okay. 
Well, thanks for the clarification. Because again, we're hearing from you. You hear one thing from the state, one thing from the county, then you're... So moving on to the next subject is the fact that our community, Rancho Palos Verdes and the peninsula is starting to reopen. And uh, for the parks, the trails, the beaches in our city are now you know, back in business. And I just wondered how for you, from a law enforcement pers perspective, how you're prepared for this. And if you have any concerns you wanna share. You know, as far as being prepared, it, it's not gonna change a whole lot for us. Um, I know the city did some soft reopenings in the past and, and we kind of assessed and <clears throat> there was really nothing major that, that impacted us. Uh, I do have some concerns though, because as, as I stated before, this is something new that none of us have gone through before. And what concerns me is that as we get into this, uh, this, this, this reopening of certain things, uh, my concern is that society and the community is just going to go back to normal the way things were before all this started. And, and that concerns me because I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Uh, this is something that's, like I said, it's unique. Uh, it's not something in my career that I've ever experienced before. Uh, and I just, I have some reservations because I've seen people that have been uh, ill, they've caught it and, and what they've gone through. And when you get into situations where it's, it's putting people on ventilators and in hospitals, um, that's just a concern. Mm -hmm. And that, that would be my only concern, my reservation about this. We're gonna move on. You presented your quarterly report to the Palos Verdes Peninsula Regional Law Committee. You all meet, um, you caught the, you know, the, the Lameda Share Station contracts with the three cities on the Hill, and you met uh, virtually and, and discussed the latest crime stats, and your report was for the first quarter. What do you wanna share, or how are we doing with crime right now in, on the peninsula, and specifically in RPV? So what's interesting is, um, we look at the first three months of the year, so January, February, March, and what I saw is January was on, on, on a, a really good low. And then in February, March, I saw um, some spikes in larceny thefts, uh, grand theft autos, commercial burglaries. Um, and so those went up a little bit. And, and it concerned me, but what happened is when the COVID-19 pandemic started and we closed businesses, I saw an immediate spike in commercial burglaries. And so what, what I gather is that the suspects, you know, they pay attention to what's going on in society and the news and all these businesses are closed. So now they're target rich to be burglarized. And you're not sure a lot, you know, the general public wasn't sure about which businesses are open or closed and what could be open, what couldn't be open. And, and so we saw that, that, that was my concern. Grand theft autos were up as well. Mm -hmm. And um, to go along with that though, and I talked about my deputies being proactive, um, we, we have some, some statistics where we actually arrested people as well. Arrests were, and, and so it's, that's a good thing. The crime's not, it's just something to manage. Now, when the COVID-19 pandemic began, uh, the sheriff allocated different resources to all the patrol stations from other units within the department. And so the first concern we had in the very beginning of this was grocery stores and the demand for paper products. Uh, demand for hand sanitizer, the demand for, you know, disinfectant wipes. And so we had lines outside stores that were selling these products. And we, we allocated deputies to go do patrol checks, uh, specifically in the grocery store parking lots, you know, in, in the, uh, whatever stores are selling these, these, uh, these products. And so we did that uh, for two things, one to keep the peace and two to put people's, you know, minds at ease that, Hey, we're out there and we're, we're, we're here for you. And so that worked out. And then the commercial burglary started. And so that's why I reallocated them a little bit and I expanded that patrol, those patrol checks, and those visibility checks into the commercial establishments. And so I, I saw that as, as, you know, it worked, it was effective. And so I saw the immediate spike in those crimes and then I saw it kind of taper off a little bit. We still had a few, um, but, but that's, that was what I saw, what my concerns were. Kudos to your, to your staff and deputies out there making these arrests. I think it's interesting. I just want to mention that I know we see maybe a spike because of the pandemic, yet at the same time with more of us sheltering in place at home, you would think too there's an increase with Neighborhood Watch, more eyes on the community, you know, which you hope that is a deterrent. So Correct. And, and what I didn't see is residential burglaries went down. We did we did have a couple, and, and I'll, I'll elaborate because you, you talk about the community and the neighborhood watch and see something, say something. And what was very interesting is we had a residential burglary where the suspects, uh, well, the, the victims had gone out for a walk. 
they were gone for maybe an hour. And when they came back, their house was burglarized. So that tells me that the bad guys were watching mm -hmm. the residents uh, at that home and they waited for them to leave. Now, if there's any more to that in regards to that, I don't know. Um, but that was just very unique. Um, and then the Grand Theft Autos are up because a lot more people are home and there's more opportunity because there are more vehicles parked on the street. I, I want to mention that if you go on your Lameda Sheriff Station's Facebook page, you asked if I wanted to learn about some of those arrests. That is a, that's an amazing documentation. There's photos of arrests and weapons that you've managed to um, pick up during arrests. And so um, that I recommend to the community just to go on and check it out. I don't know who's putting that together, but it's so uh, informative and uh, really lets you connect with what's going on. Yeah, I've got, I've got two deputies that I've assigned as my uh, social media deputies or, or the station's public information officer. And they've been very, very good um, at, at posting stuff. And I'll tell you, you're seeing a lot of stuff based on all of this. And um, the ALPR cameras um, have, have been used to capture a lot of folks. Um, you know, just the proactive uh, aggressiveness and, and, the, and the heads up policing of the deputies. Uh, there's one one just recently um, that was a residential burglary that had occurred in Rancho Palos Verdes, and they picked up the vehicle um, just as an observation, and they ended up falling it into a, a location in Torrance, and that was the one that you saw, I think, with the with the big revolver in the picture. Mm -hmm. And so and that guy was a bad guy. Yeah, that so, bad and, guy was running around Rancho Palos Verdes. So I was. And so that guy, that guy was, yeah, you know, yeah, he was up to no good, and and you know we caught him and. And hopefully the, the judicial system will lock him up for a little while. And you mentioned the ALPR during your regional law meeting that you did a presentation just to update um, what's happening with the ALPR. There'll be more cameras installed, um, automatic license uh, plate recognition uh, cameras on Western Ave. I know they'll be coming up through June and they're really making a difference. What was part of your presentation today? I guess, why don't you kind of go over what you, what you had to share? Well, what I did today is I gave a basic, uh, generic description of what they do and and, and basically they're cameras that are they're they're, they're posted in fixed locations uh they can be on a, on a police car uh, and they're basically cameras that read license plates and what they do is is they when it reads the license plate it, it would, it's equivalent to me running the plate in a computer on a car as i'm driving around and so it tells me if the, if the vehicle is wanted for anything and so if it's a felony vehicle a stolen vehicle uh, a missing person whether it's a, an amber alert or a silver alert um, it, it alerts us to that. And, and you so, mentioned silver alert. And when I saw that, I, I know we all, an amber alert when there's a child that might have been abducted. But a sil explain the silver alert. I, that was something I learned. A silver alert is, uh, it's, it's similar to an amber alert, but it's for, it's for the elders. And if there's somebody that's it's in a vehicle that's, you know, that's uh, uh, an at-risk missing person, so to speak, and there's, there's a, I mean, they're missing and, and their family and loved ones can't find them. We can put them in the system as a missing person, but if there's a license plate to go along with that, that they may be in a vehicle, we can put that into the system as well. And then when it, it uh, gets read by one of these cameras or gets run by a law enforcement officer in their car or over the radio, it alerts us to that as well. So we can bring them back in the, into a safe environment, mm -hmm. prevent them from any, any harm. The quarterly update that you gave to the regional law committee, which of course involves um, city leaders from from rpv rhe and rolling hills um and staff members uh, were there any particular concerns that they brought up that you want to uh, again uh, communicate to the residents they had a couple of concerns i know they talked about emergency preparedness as far as fire safety mm -hmm. and then there's some concerns that came uh that piggybacked along with that not just fire prevention and evacuation but also any catastrophic emergency whether it be earthquake fire, flood, you know, mud flows. And, and so um, I, I didn't elaborate in the meeting, um, but I do, I, I, one of the things that they asked about was evacuation routes and why we don't have any specific evacuation routes in documentation and writing in these plans. And, and the reason for that is because we don't know what the problem is yet or where it's going to be. And so the example I gave in there, I use the Woolsey fire as an example. Now, I was at the Woolsey fire, and one thing that, that occurred there was uh, we had a fire, and the wind was blowing in one direction, and it, it, was, it was blowing very, very significantly, and it shifted, and it shifted in the opposite direction, and it forced the fire department and law enforcement, it forced us to, to relocate some of our command posts, 
and to reallocate our strategies. Because what, what may have been an evacuation route when the wind shifts is now a dangerous route. It's a dangerous area. So we want to avoid that. And, and so we have to adapt to what's going on. Yeah. On the subject of finances, obviously the pandemic has wreaked havoc on every level of the economy. All of us are feeling it. Um, and so I wondered how it's impacted the, your budget right now and your, the resources for your team. It's, uh, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of a hit. Uh, however, it's not impacting the community. And that's the good thing. So the fortunate uh, situation I'm in is Lameda Station is four cities that contract with the Sheriff's Department. So I've got four independent cities that I oversee. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a binding legal contract where the cities invest in the Sheriff's Department to police their communities. So with that being said, there's no cuts there because you, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, is paying for a service that I'm delivering. So there's no cuts there. Where I'm seeing cuts is in what we call unfunded items. And so those are the items that are not funded by any individual city. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, my items um, are minimal there. And I can tell you that every, every uh, station captain within the department was faced with uh, a, a cutback letter, so to speak. Uh, mine was very, very minimal, and I was given the discretion to, uh, to allocate it how I see fit. And what was nice is I, I anticipated it coming. And I was, those practices were already in place. Mm -hmm. So it really didn't impact me all that much. Um, there's, there's one item that I'm moving around a little bit. So that's, that's a good thing. Any impact on the community it, at this point in the game is zero. And it just, it, it, sh it won't happen because I, we're in a binding contract. So. Right. And now um, the new, next contract's coming together as we're in budget seasons within the, within the community. So I guess we'll have to stay tuned to see how the right. loss of revenues for all of our city coffers will impact the next contract. But like you said, you know, our community is expecting a, a level of service that you've always provided. So that'll be the challenge going forward. And, uh, but we, we know we can depend on you, captain. <laughs> I mean, I'm making it work. I, you know, like I said, if, I mean, if, if I have to, I'll put my, uh, I'll put my gear on and go out in the field if I have to, if need be. I mean, that's just, that's just the way I operate. I like to sneak out of the office right now and then anyway, so it's, it helps me keep my sanity. Uh, you've been leading the, the ship there over there for, it hasn't been quite a year yet, but uh, now you're in it during the pandemic. And I just wonder what is inspiring you right now to continue in this position and lead? What, where do you get your inspiration? Wow. So, <laughs> like I said, unique times. I, I've done a lot throughout my career, uh, but never throughout my 32 years have I ever thought about, a, you know, a, a, a COVID-19 pandemic and what would I do there? You know, we prepare for earthquakes, floods, riots, and you know, you know, major, uh, you know, unruliness in, in the community. And, you know, I've been through a lot. Uh, this one, I'll tell you, it's, uh, I take it day by day. Um, I, I learned to be very, very uh, adaptive because uh, I have to adapt to certain, you know, I have to adapt. And, and you know, one thing that we, we learn in law enforcement is things don't always go the way you want them to go. They don't always go as planned. And so you have to be able to adapt. It's kept me on my toes. Um, it's helped me do a lot of personal reflection and evaluation of what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Uh, keep my patience. Um, you, you know, I, I, uh, I, I'm blessed to have the wife I have because she keeps me on my toes. Um, and so I just, uh, I, I exercise, um, I eat right. Uh, I get, I can get enough rest and those, those are getting enough rest has, has been a kind of a tricky one lately because there's just so much going on and I, you know, I don't, there's times I don't want to leave. And, and I'm, I have to, all right, no, I have to go get some rest. And so I was trying to manage all that and juggle it. Um, the inspiration, you know what, it's, it, it'll be a year in June. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was Father's Day last June when I got this job. And I, like I said, I'm very blessed. I, I, I'm loving every minute of it. I'm, it's been a challenge and I'm up for the challenge. It's a fun challenge. And uh, it's just, you know, I, I'm just trying to do the right thing. Yeah. I, I also want to add, I, it was very touching. I had, we were visiting the sheriff's station when you were hold, holding a candlelight vigil. Um, the city, our city council leaders had been going around to uh, first responders and frontline workers to thank you mm -hmm. for what you're doing. And we were delivering food um, for, for your team over there. Um, the city was, the city manager, the mayor, et cetera. And uh, it happened to coincide with what you were doing was a vigil to honor uh, fallen peace officers. Can you talk about the significance and your message to your to all your your team that was out there at the vigil? 
certainly um, this week, uh, May 10th through May 16th is National Police Week. And so every year in the month of May, um, a week is set aside uh, to remember the law enforcement officers that were killed in the line of duty and remembered by their families uh, and, and never forgotten. And, and so with, with this year, with this pandemic, uh, they had to cancel the candlelight. They have a candlelight vigil in Washington, D.C. every year, and they had to cancel it. So what they did is they did a virtual candlelight and it was, I don't know if it was last minute. It was last, it was a last minute notice for us. And so we threw something together as quick as we could. And we literally had 24 hours to do it. And, and so, um, yeah, we put it together. We, we got a group of people. We did a shift change at nine o'clock in the evening. And you guys were there uh, delivering some meals for us, which was, you know, very, very thoughtful and generous. Uh, and, and so you got to participate in that. And it was, it was, it was short, sweet. Um, and it was, it was touching. It really was. And, and so I did, I shared some things last night. Um, and one of the things that I, that I brought up was um, the officer down memorial page, which is something that, that I pay attention to. And, and I, I continue to teach at the academy and I bring that up to every class that I teach because this job, it's a lot of fun, but there's, there's a risk that comes with that. And I've seen uh, friends of mine uh, killed in the line of duty. And so I, I mentioned one last night, and, and that's uh, Deputy Stephen Blair, and he was killed on May 12, 1995. And the reason that it's significant with me is because I went to high school with Steve, and I went to grammar school with his wife. And so it was just a touching moment. And then I also reminded them that we have a memorial in the back of our station, and we have another one inside our station for Deputy Brandon Hinkle. It was killed in the line of duty on February 14th in uh, 2001. And so those are things that, you know, they strike a nerve with you. And, and it's, it's important that we not forget. And, and so every year in the month of May, that's, that's the week that we remember the law enforcement officers. Well, thank you for sharing and helping us remember because you make the ultimate sacrifice. And I think now, again, being emphasized more by the pandemic because you're risking your lives in other ways with this, with this, with this virus being out there. And um, I just wanna, so as we wrap it up here, I'm, I wonder what your thoughts are on our community stepping up and, and helping you and, and, and do the work you do. What's your message to the community about that? So I, with regards to that, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of community policing and partnerships in the community. That's what I teach. I, I've taught for many years. And, uh, you know, the involvement of the community is, is so important to deal with a quality of life, to ensure that our quality of life is, is up to speed. And, you know, we've said it before, see something, say something. Uh, we've talked about it in, in, in prior questions and answers here about the involvement of the community and, and to keep their eyes open. Uh, and, and so I'll reinforce that. You know, unfortunately, just because we're locked down or restricted in, in our, our everyday lifestyles now, um, the crooks that violate the law, well, they're not going to care about any other laws as well. So we, we need to be vigilant about that and, and keep our eyes open. Uh, and in addition to that, with, with the new COVID-19 uh, that's really not so new anymore, um, it's important that we be safe, that we stay safe, um, and be patient because we'll get through this. And, you know, we talk about compliance and wearing a mask and, you know, it's, it's, it's awkward and it's, it's out of our, our normal everyday life and our, our, our way of living, but, you know, we're going to have to adapt to that. And for me personally, and I think for the, the safety of, of everybody in the community, um, wearing a mask, and I don't think we're asking all that much. And so your safety and the safety of the community is what's important to me. Well, I've been sheltering at home here for the most part, right here in Rancho Palos Verdes. And, uh, but now that we can get out more and be in our public spaces, that helps a lot. But I, anything, well, any last minute announcements from the Alameda Sheriff Station as we, we are going to wrap it up? The only other stuff is, you know, I, 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 look, at the, I look at the future and I look at the economy and, and you know, it's, it's uh, interesting times. And uh, I'm going to do everything I, in my power to, to manage what I, what I, what I can within my, within my control. And I want to ensure to the community that, you know, we're there for you. And, and if you guys need anything, please call us and we'll be there to help. Okay. Thank you again for serving the community. Our motto now in Richard Palace Verdes is RPV together. And we're so glad we're together with the Lamina Sheriff Station. And we will check back in with you and uh, you can give us an update and keep uh, keeping our community safe. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Captain Powers. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there. Mm -hmm.